right, well, it's seven o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to our program this evening, uh, Creating Habitat for Birds and Butterflies. My name is Beth. I'm the adult programming uh, librarian for the Mid-Continent Public Library System. Um, and so we're excited to have uh, Lisa uh, from Burr Oak Woods with us this evening for the program. All right. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm going to be, I'm going to start sharing a screen that has uh, PowerPoint information, and lots of cool pictures to look at. I will be taking questions through the chat as uh, we go. So instead of just, just doing questions at the end, we'll do questions all the time. We're, we're, we will try. All right. Is that looking good? So um, it is. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then I don't know if this goes away. The top. So you can't see the top weird stuff at the top of the screen. Is it just sharing my PowerPoint? Oh, think. sorry, I was muted. There is a box at the top that's still showing. Yeah, I was trying to figure out like how to do I make that go away. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, now I've got it open worse. <laughs> maybe maybe it goes, mm -hmm. try stop sharing and okay, so just share stop. again. Okay, I will try to do that again. Uh, maybe the first version. Yeah. I, yeah, I can't quite tell what they can see. Oh, now I've clicked it too many times. Let me go to the very first one. Let me do that. I'm sorry. There we go. Well, this might be the best we can get. So we're trying to attract birds and butterflies um, closer to our house and have them around our very own part of our world. And in order to do that, we have to plant native plants, which can be trees or these beautiful flowers, lots of different butterflies. But every good habitat doesn't just have food as a component. It has lots of, uh, oh, and uh, Missouri has changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, this is a map that shows pre-settlement of, of European people to Missouri. The blue was originally prairie. So it would have been mostly tall grass prairie with lots of different uh, diversity of wildflowers and grasses. And then the brown would have been our forests in Missouri and the Ozarks. These days we actually have about 93% of Missouri is public, or sorry, is privately owned land. So that 93% is agriculture and residential. And then 7% of our 45 million acres in Missouri is public land, which is actually fairly generous. As you go east, the states have less. So when we talk about these native plants, they are plants that originated in Missouri and they are adapted to the weather here and part of the ecosystem. They were originally in Missouri and not brought here from another part of the world. <laughs> we all need a good habitat. So this is kind of like what our habitats look like for people. Uh, we like short grass around our houses. Um, I guess we want, we want to be able to see if somebody's coming toward our house. And of course, in a new neighborhood like this, there's no trees that have been planted They've pretty much scraped all the trees off so they could uh, make it for people. But there are some still some trees around the edges. So this is gonna bring in birds and butterflies to this neighborhood and other animals. But getting them close to your house is maybe what you might be interested in. So we gotta provide the food and water, shelter and space, just like the, what we want to survive. So who's hungry? <laughs> for at least for butterflies, we need the plants that the caterpillars eat. 
and we need the flowers to provide nectar and pollen for other insects. So this is our example of the monarch caterpillar for the monarch butterfly. And we have many species of milkweed, but they do just eat our milkweed species. Uh, the adults are on some blazing star. I think this is rough blazing star. And this is starting to, it's almost blooming, this species. We have a lot of prairie blazing star blooming right now. Um, this one is a tiger swallowtail on some, I think, biddens, like a tick seed plant. And of course, we do also like our hummingbirds. So, and they like red. And everyone kind of knows that usually they're attracted to the color red because there's a lot of flowers in nature that have a tubular shape that is adapted for their tongue and their beak to be able to get that nectar. Right now, our royal catchfly the, is blooming and the hummingbirds are going to that a lot. The columbine was blooming in the springtime. So that's what this picture shows. The columbine is pretty awesome. It can bloom into the first part of June even. But the catchfly has taken all the glory right now. And I don't, I think I have, oh, I forgot I had video, uh, audio of that hummingbird noise. Let's see, how do I play that again? I'm just gonna do that again. They're not very loud. They kind of squeak as they go by. So if you think that didn't sound like a very loud bird call, it's that it's naturally not very loud. And I didn't talk about that, that um, bird nest, they use spider webs and lichen to make their nest. That way it can grow with the babies. So here's some other really good plants that you can plant for hummingbirds and also can be good for butterflies. That royal catchfly down at the bottom is the one that's blooming right now. Um, if you have a wet place or in a pond, or a bog, the cardinal flower can grow there. Um, our our penstemons have already bloomed. Our bee balm is on, one of them is almost done. The tall bergamot, and then the honeysuckle still blooming. The meadow flax and garden flax are gorgeous right now, and our blue sage has not quite started. So it's good to have. We want to have things that bloom spring and into early summer, midsummer, late summer, and fall, so that there's always some food out there for them is the, ide is the ideal thing that we wanna do. So, and also there's different reasons and different seasons. So that has to do with after a, a plant is done blooming, then it makes seeds. And if you have a, a plant that the birds like, like this goldfinch <laughs> on the right here, they love the cone flowers. And cone flowers can be a, a great choice if you don't have a lot of space to plant because they'll attract the butterflies and the birds. It's a really good seed source. And then if you do have a little more space and you want some more uh, taller plants, some texture, some woodies, um, one, of the plant, one of the plants we like the best is the arrowwood viburnum or there's nannyberry, there's black haw, there's other viburnum sluts that are native. Um, instead of a cultivated viburnum that you might be more familiar with. They, those are sold a lot for people. But these are the native viburnums. They make really great berries. The birds will eat all of. And we have one right outside our office window. And every fall and early winter, I love watching the birds come and eat. We'll have bluebirds and sometimes cedar waxwings, robins, hermit thrushes, all eating those berries. Um, the black haw here is in the middle. And then, and what's great about these woodies is that you get this nice spring blooming and then you get the berries and the fall colored leaves later. Coral berry and buckbrush are pretty, but they're not the best food source for the, the wildlife. They will eat them, but it's not, it's not super nutritious. It's often one of those signs that an area was overgrazed because the cattle didn't like to eat it. So you'll see a lot of buckbrush in uh, wooded areas that cows are not on anymore, but they were. And then uh, as we go into fall, not too much longer from now, we will see the Virginia creeper, the poison ivy, it's a very pretty picture of poison ivy. 
and the green briar too. And even though, I, you know, I'm allergic to poison ivy, I don't really, I don't like itching. Nobody enjoys that. Um, it is a really good food source for the birds. There's 75 different species of songbirds that eat poison ivy berries and they, it's nutritious and delicious for them. Um, they will eat them usually in the early part of the winter. It, it'll be gone because, you know, you always eat the yummy food first. And then what do they do though? They go to the bathroom, they sit, they sit on a fence and they'll poop out those seeds and then you get more poison ivy wherever those seeds go. Um, and right now these are all pretty much blooming. So the sunflowers are making those seeds that the birds like are things in the cone flower and sunflower groups. These yellow composites and pink composites are great choices. Um, so oxeye, sunflower, compass plant, Missouri coneflower, that's a really great one for by a mailbox because it only gets a couple of feet tall and it stays in one clump and it blooms a long time. And again, the glade coneflower is very different than a purple coneflower and a yellow or pale purple. The purple coneflower that is commercially grown a little bit more now, you can get, I think you can get some cultivars of it at like Lowe's and Home Depot, Walmart sometimes. It le actually likes more shade. Um, a little, it, it does better, but it can also get quite competitive. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still getting over that cold. Get competitive and take over an area. So I, I like these other echinacea, like the glade coneflower on the left bottom down here um, and the yellow because they stay in one spot and don't tend to outcompete other plants around them. Smaller leaves too. Um, uh, so does anybody know what our state flower is? I know I could ask the chat window. Think about it in your head because it's kind of confusing. Both our state flower is a tree and then our tree has the word flower in it. So just kind of a little bit of trivia. Um, the flowering dogwood is the state tree of Missouri. Beautiful tree. A lot of people plant it as a ornamental tree in their yard. The berries are great for bluebirds and other, other birds. And then um, the state flower is a hawthorn, which is also a small tree in Missouri. There's lots of different species of hawthorn but it is, I don't have a picture of it on here, but it is our state flower. And then I, I can't see my label on this, but I, this is a chinkapin oak. Show my, that I actually know what I'm talking about here. Um, chinkapin oaks are great because they make kind of a small acorn that even bluebirds and a lot of woodpecker species can eat. The deer and the turkeys love them too. Everyone's pretty much like gobbling them up because they're bite size. <laughs> And so that's some of the other oak species make a little, quite a bit larger oak acorns. All right, so we get some more bird sounds in here. Um, the downy woodpecker, it always kind of, to me, think, kind of sounds like they might be sneezing or scolding us while sneezing. And we have, this is probably our most common woodpecker. Great for the other birds. If you have trees in your neighborhood with some limbs that have died, or old snags, the whole tree's dead. These birds will make a hole in that tree and build a nest. And then warblers, titmice, chickadees, many other birds that don't make their own nest hole, they need woodpeckers to do that first and then they will nest there too. There's the sneeze. <laughs> so at the end there, it's sort of like a de descending doo -doo 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 -doo, as they are almost like scolding us. And he was eating some suet. If you're not sure what, he, what that bird was on. And then the American goldfinch are also a great bird to have in your neighborhood. They can still be pretty common, but they love uh, bird seed that we can put in a feeder or put out growing. Uh, they don't look yellow in the winter. So in the summer, they have that yellow feathers. And then in the winter, the males lose a lot of their yellow and they'll still have black and white wings, but have some yellow on them. 
I'm going to check this little chat window. Let's see, show chat. Is it going to let me see that? Hmm, maybe not. Aha. Can we get a copy of the PowerPoint? It says, um, I could send a PDF version of it. I think it won't be too large to be able to do that. All right, let's see. Is it going to play the goldfinch noise? I'm not sure. I think they kind of sound like a bubbly, happy sound. And they're sometimes it sounds like they're saying potato chip when they sing. <laughs> let's see if it'll do that again. Yeah, like a bubbly, bubbly, bubbly potato chip. <laughs> and then when they fly, they say sweet, sweet, sweet. No, and a lot of birds, they love to have some water around. So a bird bath that you keep clean but that can be something that takes quite a bit of maintenance. Um, so an actual bubbler that has a constant flow of a little fountain water, they love that. We have one here in our bird feeder area and there's like a little divot in the rock that the water comes out of and the titmice, the, the goldfinches, like everybody's out there just taking bath in that water. And it's really fun to watch. So some people think that cardinals say, what cheer, what cheer, or they might say pretty, pretty bird, 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 bird. Those are the two. I kind of think they almost sound like video game noise, the way that they, um, it's kind of nasally and sonic. I'll play it one more time. He just kept doing the like cheer, 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 cheer. <laughs> um, we don't have white-throated sparrows right now, but they do, they do spend a lot of time here all winter long. And um, they'll come to bird feeders and be in your backyard. And I think I have their call. They say, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. You said Canada really fast. Canada, Canada. <laughs> yeah. Um, and th so they go back to the boreal forests for nesting season in the summer, um, just like our um, juncos in this part of the country. They don't stay here in the winter. All right. We don't want to forget the butterflies, too. So those were just a sampling of some of the birds you might attract to your backyard. Um, butterflies like water too. So um, you could make like a puddling area. And I've seen people use an upside down trash can lid, put sand in it, put a little bit of mineral salt in there, but you don't want hardly any salt. I mean, you, it'll want some salt, but you don't want to overdo it. There's probably a formula you can look up online for that. But I've seen just, just using sand and not adding anything else. Um, you can also make places where you put out fruit that has gotten too ripe for you to eat and that can attract in some of the butterflies to like a puddling pooling we call it puddling when butterflies uh, do this they sort of make like a a whole group of butterflies enjoying the same mineral lick they will do it on also places where animals have gone to the bathroom so there might be scat there or where they number one <laughs> i don't know a polite way to say that for animals um, okay, and then in the winter time, we have a totally different landscape. So we also try to think about what do these animals need when the weather is not so nice, when they need some shelter for the harsh time of the year. And I don't have another slide, but I'm going to go back to the snow for just a moment. <laughs> so um, this is where brush piles in the very far corners of your yards and also leaving standing stems and letting there be um, parts of your garden that you don't clean up at all. We now, we now recommend leaving at least the back of your bed standing because there are pollinators and uh, butterflies and moth caterpillars. There's a lot of animals that stay over winter and may not emerge until May or even later from their 
uh, chrysalises and cocoons. So keeping that shelter for them, it can be really important. I can then, now I've got another house wren. I thought we were out of birds, but this is a little house wren. They can be pretty easy to attract because you can put out a little house for them. And I, I think they have a pretty song. It's, uh, it's all over the place. You'll have to hear it. <laughs> So very chatty, kind of a very chatty, garbly, little bit pretty song too. They eat a lot of insects, and of course, when we think of uh, butterflies, we want to, we want the caterpillar to turn into a butterfly. But there's a lot of um, other caterpillars, there's fly larvas that are on leaves, and lots of moth caterpillars that the birds need to, to feed their babies. So we're also supplying a link in the food chain by planting plants that those caterpillars are going to eat. Uh, but nobody wants to eat this one because it looks like bird poop. And so the giant swallowtail, when it's smaller, will look like bird poop. And as it gets bigger, before it changes, you might have seen a picture of one that looks like a, a green snake's face. The giant swallowtail looks like a brown snake's face if you look up what they look like before they turn into a chrysalis. And there's their chrysalis now. Now they wanna look like a stick on the tree because birds don't eat sticks and hopefully they're gonna be hiding and can make it to be being a butterfly. Oh, there, I do have a picture of the tiger swallowtail which is similar to the spice bush swallowtail. The eyes aren't quite, or the spots aren't quite as prominent. Um, the Eastern tiger swallowtail looks similar, but the spice bush is the one that has the really big spots. And then that giant swallowtail is like this, but brown with some other markings in there. So they're trying not to get eaten, just kind of fun. And then of course, um, all these animals need space. So um, having enough food and water and shelter within one area, enough for all so that they can find a place to build their nest. Bluebirds are cavity nesters too. So either putting up a bluebird house or leaving that dead tree that's back by the creek and not worrying about it, just letting it, letting it be part of the environment. I keep forgetting that everything has a bird call. So they have a very cheery, like almost like chip, chip, cheerio, like a happy song, sound to their call. I don't think I have the cedar waxwing call in here. Now cedar waxwings have such a high pitched call that some people can't even hear it. If you've lost some of your high, high um, hearing range, um, they almost sound like a very high pitched whistle and it's very quiet. I don't think it's on here. No, it isn't. Um, so painted lady, uh, painted lady butterflies is what is in this picture, and they are very common in this area. They like to eat, I think it is thistle plants. We also have American lady that looks similar to this. American lady butterflies that eat pussy toes. That's what those plants are called that they like. Um, and and uh, so if you don't if you don't have thistle around or pussy toes, then these butterflies might still show up, but they're not going to fly that far unless the plants are closer to your neighborhood. Um, and then um, this is a great plant to plant. So butterfly milkweed is beautiful. It can be a dark to a light orange and can handle full sun and pretty bad soil. If like any plant though, when it's getting established, it tends to like some water, but not overwatered. <laughs> uh, Well-drained, but watered soil. Uh, this one has a monarch on it. And I was gonna say that, that does not look like a black swallowtail quite. The, it's not a pipe vine, it might be a spice bush swallowtail. I have to look up the orange spots on the wings. Uh, this is a male monarch. There's this little baby spot on his wing that is a little bit bigger on this vein. And that's how we tell if it's a male or a female. The males have the spots. And then what happens to butterflies in the winter? We don't always think about it, 
We don't we don't see them. They're not there. So we don't think about them. Some of them will the adults will die, and only the eggs or chrysalis will overwinter, will hibernate basically. Um, some adults will overwinter as the adult butterfly. You come out to Burrell Woods on a day that we have 60 or 70 degree weather in January, which occasionally, it usually happens about once a January. Um, and you will see um, there's a butterfly called a comma butterfly. There's a one that has a little question mark, mark on its wing and sometimes mourning cloaks. You'll be walking down the trail and see a butterfly flying through the air. It's pretty cool. And then when it gets cold again, go find some tree bark to hibernate in. And of course, we know some that migrate, uh, painted ladies migrate. It's there's a famous migration of them in Europe where they go up to, I think they're in England and they go down to Northern Africa. So kind of like how monarchs migrate here in our country. So, yep, the monarch, <laughs> there's a great website called Monarch Watch. I did look at this PowerPoint earlier today, but I keep forgetting what's next. Um, so if you go to monarchwatch.org, you can find out everything you ever wanted to learn about monarchs, at least in Missouri and the Midwest, and what we've learned about uh, their behavior. Um, we actually have programs here too. And like she was saying, there's some gonna be at the library this, this fall in September. And there are little stickers that we put on the butterflies. This one is a male, if you can see that little spot again. And if uh, you find, if they find a, a dead one in Mexico or somewhere else the next spring, I think we found, they found some in Texas in early spring that were um, tagged at the, the Need to Be Gorman Discovery Center. I know that they at least found one um, maybe five years ago. So we're like, hey, they found one of our butterflies. It's kind of cool. Um, a few winter guests at the feeder or gems. Um, one of my favorite birds out here because when they sing, they sound like they're laughing, like ha 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 ha. Good song. <laughs> so the white breasted nuthatch. Lisa, um, someone asked how they get the tags on without damaging the wings. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yes, the there's a certain way that you have to hold the body of the butterfly that basically down at their thorax, you can hold that part of them. We, we try not to touch any other part of the wing and then you get the tag ready. <laughs> and you place it, you're supposed to place it right there on the middle of their wing. And then we do just press gent like gentle pressure on both sides of the, the wings where, where they meet. And that's the only places we touch and then let them go. Um, so far, it doesn't seem, it doesn't weigh enough to damage them. The first time they made, uh, they made them square for a couple of years when they first came out and dating myself like, 20 years ago when I was this young naturalist and it went on the outside edge of the wing. So these, these circle stickers seem to be um, a much better option. Let's see, enter, there we go. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the black cap chickadee. We do have quite a few of those and those are also the cavity nesters, one of our smaller birds. Oh. They kind of sound like they say cheeseburg, cheeseburger, and then they say chickadee dee dee. They say their name is like their call. Their song is that pretty whistle. The northern flicker, they kind of will say flicker, 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 flicker. The first time I heard one doing that though, it sounded like a small dog had a squeaky toy and they were chewing on their squeaky toy. I'm not, I don't know if that's in this recording. So that one just did the other part of their song, not the squeaky part that they're named after. 
Here's our tufted titmouse. These are super common in, in at Burrell Woods. They're one of our most common birds. I think even, they're even more common than the chickadees, at least in our near the nature center. They love to come and get all the bird seed. And I saw one taking a bath in the water today at the bubbler. They're a little bigger than a chickadee. And they like to say, Peter, Peter, Peter. Also say a lot of other things though. The, tif the tufted titmouse is kind of a, it's a, one of those birds that's known for lots of different vocalizations and different sounds that it makes. And it can do like a slow peter, peter, or peter, 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 and scolding noises when you're too close. <laughs> so happy habitats for everyone is um, different ways that you can arrange plants. Uh, being able to mow next to an edge can be an easy way to still have some space for your, you know, your children to play, throw the ball around, have your dogs and not going into the garden. Um, and or a rock edge border along the edge of your plants can be a nice border. And not forgetting like the grasses. Grasses make a lot of seed too, and they can be quite ornamental. So it's nice to plant not just wildflower or plants with lots of big flowers, but also some grasses for texture. And planting shorter plants at the edges of your borders and taller plants behind them can also be make for a, a little more aesthetic looking planting. And that is my last slide in that show. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and I, we can take some more questions. We've got another question in chat. Bearing in mind, most butterflies live for a few weeks, maybe months, how far can they migrate or how can they migrate so far? Um, a lot of species don't migrate. Very, they will stay, they'll have usually two broods a summer is the average for a, most species. Um, so it can be very individual. And then the last brood would, the adults would then lay eggs and what, whatever those are going to, however it survives through the winter, whether it's going to be an adult butterfly or go into a, a chrysalis or even a caterpillar sometimes. So that's, I've actually made a whole, um, I made uh, some visual aids for myself about this because I wanted to know which species did what, like how did they, what did they do in the winter? And out of the 25 common species, it was about a third, there were like a third that migrated and about a third that hibernated as adults and about a third that hibernated in chrysalis. Um, most of the swallowtails are hibernating in chrysalis. So it, it's, I just, I could, I could go into that, but yeah. A lot of them don't live more than, like you said, one to three months. So good question. Is there any other questions right yes. now? Yeah. Um, it says, I feed the hummingbirds in the summer, but only feed seeds in the winter. I have a bird bath. Should I also put out seed in the summer? Um. It's not as important to put out seed in the summer and fall because there are a lot, it, it depends on your neighborhood too. I, I guess I should, I'd say that um, in a lot of the neighborhoods around uh, Burrell Woods, they're gonna be getting birds that already can find lots of food here. And we'll hear people say either one or the other, they'll either have tons of birds at their feeder or no birds at their feeder. And when people say they have no birds in the fall, late summer and fall, then we say it's probably because you have fields or something that's a lot of wild bird food source nearby that they're eating that because we see a, a drop in birds at the feeders. We don't put out suet in the summer. We do the hummingbird nectar instead. So the places where we would hang suet, we put nectar and we put out less bird seed in the summer, um, but it's not bad to do it. 
but if you're not, if it's not going to get eaten, you don't want it to start to get moldy either. And that can cause uh, spread diseases. So are there, it's up to you. <laughs> are there particular kinds of seeds that you recommend putting out or mixes? Um, well, we always use black oil sunflower seed. Um, it's the one of the, it, the most birds like to eat it and it's not that expensive. There's other things like a safflower seed. It's expensive, but the squirrels don't like it. So if you have a problem with squirrels, you might want to use safflower or bring your feeders in for a while. And then a, a seed mix can be good if you have warning doves and some other birds around that eat off the ground. But that can also attract starlings and house sparrows, which you may not want to bring in. So the black oil is the easiest and, and least expensive way to go. I'm looking at some of these questions over here too. Let's see. If... All right, so it looks like you've answered all those. <laughs> Let me see if you're at the beginning. Yep. So I thought um, that I thought that would go kind of quick and that I could share some another slideshow that has more about different types of butterflies that live in this part of Missouri. And I'll get the thing up. Let's see. Hmm. Um, caterpillars love to eat our parsley. Is oh, there a yes. plant you can recommend that will appeal to the caterpillars more than our parsley? <laughs> more than your parsley. Oh, well, th those are specifically the black swallowtail eats plants in the carrot family. So they'll eat Queen Anne's lace, which is in every field out here, I think. It's kind of weedy. But the parsley, I think, has those nice broader leaves and the, the texture of the parsley leaf is, is um, it's kind of thinner and easy for the caterpillars to eat. But if you had some, they also like dill and carrots, of course. I'm trying to think what is, I planted a bunch of dill and they were all over my dill and they ate that. I, I had some parsley, I think they ate a little bit of that too, but they were on the dill more. They also like golden alexanders, which is in that same family. And I planted some recently. I didn't see any black swallowtail caterpillars on it yet. They do, they do tend to prefer that parsley versus Queen Anne's lace, but you could try and you can find Queen Anne's lace about anywhere, go get some seed and plant it. You won't get rid of it probably once you plant it. It's hard to, to make, the, make it go away. It makes a lot of seed. So I was gonna open up this other PowerPoint and share it because butterflies are awesome. And it's, um, let's see, I have to, oh, I did not share that yet, my bad. I need to, where am I, am I off? Let's see, share screen, there we go. <laughs> Someone says their cat's going nuts with bird sounds. Oh. Now, am I sharing the butterfly slideshow? Yes. Okay, thank you. So we have some pretty amazing butterflies and I've only shared a few pictures of some of them. When I move my mouse around, can you see my little arrow moving? Yes. Okay, so right now I'm circling around the monarch chrysalis and there's a, a caterpillar of the monarch in the J. So they'll hang upside down and put some silk around their uh, bottom of their abdomen so they stick to a stick and then after mm, I forget how many hours it is it's like a day or less in the J then the skin will split open and actually fall off and underneath will be this the chrysalis starting to solidify which is pretty cool to watch we get to watch it here because we bring in caterpillars and put them on their own little camera in the lobby 
So one of the most known butterflies, the monarch, and these are both pictures of a male. There's that spot again. If they open with the open wing, you can really see the little spot. They think it has something to do with pheromones, like glands or something for the male. Um, but they are a very large butterfly with the wings open. I don't know about that four inches. Oh, uh, I guess they could be about four inches with the wings open. It sounds kind of big. But yeah, widespread. They're actually worldwide. I was visiting um, New Zealand long ago and I was just looking around and thought, did the monarch just fly by me? <laughs> I didn't know at the time that monarchs were global. They actually have a, a global distribution. Uh, the viceroy looks a lot like the monarch. They have the same kind of colors, black and white and orange, but then they do, they have a black line that connects on their lower wings. So a solid black line, and they're a little smaller. We don't see them that often, and we definitely see monarchs more, but they do like to be around wetlands a little bit. The cabbage white, if you have any broccoli that you've planted, or uh, I'm trying to think, anything in the, the mustard family, I think that's cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, those, those plants, those little green caterpillars that you wash off of them when you bring them in, they're probably cabbage white butterflies. We do have a species called checkered white that is not the same species that what will some, it's starting to be more prevalent in Missouri and Kansas City even. And the male looks a lot like the cabbage white. The female has more checkered on her. And I've seen them here at Burrow Woods in the past couple of years. There's a lot of little yellow butterflies. And <laughs> they, uh, they might be called a clouded sulfur. Um, sulfur referring to like the mineral that's yellow. They don't have a smell like in sulfur. Or if they've got a black silhouette that looks like a little dog's face, like a little snout, then you could call it dog face sulfur. There's also a really large yellow that we call a cloudless sulfur. They don't have the black line on the inside. So if you see a really big yellow butterfly, it's probably this one. I actually haven't seen one yet lately. I did a butterfly survey today and I saw a lot, I saw eight little yellows, which I don't think are in here. Yeah, I don't have one on this slideshow, but the little yellows today were more common. They're a, little, a small yellow butterfly, <laughs> looks like that. Um, those little blue butterflies, Beth and I were talking about this before we opened up um, the virtual, that one of the weird caterpillars that I saw as a kid, but and thought was some little alien bug that I did not recognize was a caterpillar of probably an eastern tailed blue or a gray hair streak. It was like a flat, green, squishy rectangle, almost like with the consistency of a gummy bear on a blade of grass. And I remember thinking, I don't know what this is, but I'm not touching it. <laughs> but it was very, very weird looking. I think I flipped it over though. I did, and I looked at it and I could see like a mouth parts on it. So I knew it was some kind of bug like thing. The gray hair streak is just a little bit bigger than the Eastern tail blue. And yeah, a little bit more gray than blue, that one is. And then we also have spring or summer azures, which are kind of blue gray, but then when they open their wings, you might see some more blue on them. They like to hang out in the forest. So we'll see them on the forest edge in the forest more. I saw one of those today too. The zebra swallowtails, they have peaked already this year. They usually start pretty early. We'll see them in, in even in March and early April. They lay their eggs only on pawpaw trees. And they like to use the short pawpaws, like down low on the ground to hide their caterpillars. Um, beautiful butterfly. And there's still some, they will have their final brood that will hibernate in chrysalis. But right now is kind of the lower numbers of their population. There were in the spring. I've never seen so many as we saw this spring, though. Um, tiger swallowtail, kind of the same thing right now. We're just starting to kind of get our, we'll, we'll be ramping up our butterfly numbers going into August and September. 
haven't seen many of these lately. They're our second largest butterfly. I think that's right. They're just a little smaller than the giant swallowtail. They have the long black stripes on the inner kind of part of their wing. And then the females, some of the females, not all, can be this dark color and have no, no yellow on them whatsoever. There's the giant swallowtail. When their wings are closed, they have quite a bit of yellow. When their wings are open, they're more, it's like reverse. It's all this black with yellow stripes. So gorgeous to see them flying around and they eat citrus plants. So there's some kind of rue that people can plant that they will eat that's not native. The, in the South, they can be a pest on orange trees, and I guess lemon and lime trees too. In Missouri, the native they eat that's in the citrus family is called prickly ash and there's a wafer ash. They're not an ash. The way we name things, I know, uh, it's confusing. They're not a real, a true ash species. So, but the, I have tons of prickly ash at my farm in Ray County, and we see quite a bit of the giant swallowtail. And we see them in her, her oak woods too. And there's this black swallowtail that someone was talking about eating their parsley. This is the one that eats the parsley. <laughs> And they have the orange spots all touch on part of their wing, on the inner part. And then on the outer, there is a place where you can't quite see an orange spot. And they're medium sized. When their wings are open and they're flying around, you can usually see that yellow line on each wing. And then there's a couple of swallowtails we usually don't get in Kansas City area, which is the spice bush because there aren't that many spice bush up here. This is a plant that usually grows in the Ozarks or from Lake of the Ozarks, kind of part of the state and south. I've got spice bush planted. They're planted here at Burr Oak Woods and at my farm. And I have not yet seen, <laughs> we've, I think I've seen the caterpillars on the spice bush a couple times out at Burr Oak Woods, not at my farm, it's further north. The other one, the pipe vine, I did have a pipevine swallowtail on my Dutchman's pipevine this year in Ray County, and we didn't see it at Brooklyn's, but it will occasionally make it this far north. Gorgeous blue, like an iridescent blue color around the bright orange spots. If you go canoeing in the Ozarks, this is one, uh, this and the spice bush are ones you'll see a lot at the sides of the, our scenic rivers. This one's common, the red spotted purple, looks a lot like a swallowtail, but no tails. And it loves to puddle in our parking lot here and go to like little wet spots at the edge of the forest or at the edge of the shade. This is one that's pretty common. We should start seeing them soon. I haven't seen them yet this year. Uh, the ones that like to land on people are the hackberry emperors or a hackberry butterfly, they call them. They eat hackberry as a caterpillar and they land on people and will lick the salt when we're sweating on our skin. Like I was doing butterfly survey today and butterfly was flying around me and I just stood still so it could land on me. And then I could count as I found a hackberry emperor in the prairie. That happened a couple of times. <laughs> Uh, the snout butterfly also likes to do that, land on people and salty things. They have a big proboscis, their nose part, and they're smaller than the hackberry. So when their wings are open, then you can see lots of orange. And then there's a tawny emperor that also I think he eats hackberry too and looks a little different. Those butterflies I said that hibernate as an adult and they will fly around in January on a warm day here at Baroque Woods in many places. The question mark butterfly, they actually have these little silvery marks on their wing that look like a little question mark. Um, sometimes we call them angle wings because their wings have lots of angles at the edges. So if I see one and it doesn't land, then I put unknown angle wing on my survey because it was, it could have been a comma, which is the next one here, or a question mark. 
And the comma, of course, has a little comma on its wing. And when their wings are closed up, they're trying to be super camouflaged and hide against the tree bark. And then when they're flying, they've got the orange. They also could kind of blend in with leaf litter on the forest floor when their wings are open. Oh, and then I have that. So you can see that close up, <laughs> the question mark, two spots. And there's two types of commas that we have here. The morning cloak is related to them and they'll also be awake in the winter. I haven't seen that many at Burrow Woods, but I used to see a lot at Martha Lafitte Thompson Nature Sanctuary in Liberty, Missouri. This is the one that we saw when it was nice and warm in January. A red admiral looks a lot like a painted lady with its wings closed. When they open up, you see these nice red stripes on their wings. And there's the painted lady, which looks a lot like an American lady. And I don't know if that's my next, oh, the, the, here's my, I know I had that sheet there, as you can see. These are all awesome to have at your flowers and fairly common. They like a lot of cone flower. Oh, they come to our cone flowers for the nectar. The American has larger circles on the outside of the wing. And the Red Admiral has kind of more blue on the outside. And there's just a few more butterflies in here, but the Buckeye butterfly, when they open up their wings, gorgeous patterns, nice circles, and almost like these little bands, like war paint on the top of their wings or something like football players like put on their face or something. Um, when their wings are closed, we actually had trouble identifying one once that would not open its wings. We we're like, what is this little tan butterfly? We couldn't even see the circle it kept its wings so tightly closed and then finally figured out that it was a buckeye butterfly that wouldn't open its wings <laughs> and there's a couple of small orange and black butterflies that fly around and you might think they're a moth even and then they land and open up and it's like whoa they'll hit you with this beautiful um, brown and orange or black and orange pattern the pearl crescent is a little bit smaller than the silvery checker spot. In our part of the state, the silvery checker spot can be more common actually than the pearl crescent, especially in the late summer. The one that, oh my goodness, I've never seen so many of these except for this year. The great spangled fritillary is as large as a monarch pretty much, um, but they don't have the black edging on their wings. And when they close up and land on a flower, you're going to see these awesome silver spots. That's the spangle. Um, and when they're opened up, they could be, if they're fresh, they'll have kind of more orange and brown. And then if they're a faded, older adult, they might look kind of washed out. I saw some today that I saw one that looked like it just emerged was pristine. So pretty. And I saw some that were kind of washed out today too. Um, when I say I saw the most I'd ever seen this spring, or I guess it would have been June. In June, their population usually peaks, and we would see maybe like five dozen just around the nature center. I would count from the employee parking lot to the front door of the nature center. I saw nine dozen when they peaked this year. Like they literally, you walked out of the building and butterflies were, were, were hitting you. There were so many butterflies around. And they're mostly were the fritillary. And that was that also had to or peaked uh, had to do when the um, the coneflowers were also all in full bloom. The variegated fritillary. I saw one of these just the other day. I had to look it up again just to make sure I knew what I was looking at because they're they're not as common, smaller than the other fritillary. And then the largest of our skippers, which a skipper is not a butterfly and it is not a moth. Scientists have done all the genetic testing now, and they figured out that skippers should be in their own group. Um, when we do our butterfly surveys, though, we count skippers. They've always, they've always been included, so um, we're still counting them. And this is the largest one with the silver spot. So the silver spotted skipper is one that is kind of easy to recognize, and you can write that down. Oh, I saw one of those for sure. I, today I saw 
a skipper called Zebulon skippers. We had three male Zebulons just out here on the coneflower. And they were really pretty. They're yellow and brown and almost look like they've been painted those bright colors, almost like they're on fire or something. Oh, I have a picture probably. No, I don't have the Zebulon. They kind of look like a fiery skipper, like this picture, but more orange, bright orange, and then brown. But so we have other small species of skippers. These are just some of the common ones. We've got like, oh, about 10 more that you'll see in this area. And something else we see a lot, the one in the middle here, the common wood nymph. We see those on the trails I saw three or four today on my survey. They always fly out of the edge of the woods and then go over to the prairie and get some nectar. And then they'll fly back into the woods. The goatweed leaf wings are so cool when they close up that you can't see them. And then when, they're, when they open up their wings, these beautiful orange wings, um, they eat goatweed as a caterpillar and another plant called hogwart. We actually have a plant, a native plant called hogwart in Missouri. It's an annual and it usually grows on disturbed ground and glades. And um, the goatweed as well is an annual. I have tons at my farm and I never pull it out um, unless it's like in the middle of my strawberry bed, but I let it grow and I have lots of goatweed leaf wing butterflies. Uh, Jeanette here's some, asks, I'm sorry, is yeah. there a better time of day to see them? Yes, um, the weather affects when they can fly. It just has to be above, I'm trying to think, is it seven? They fly better when it's above 80 in the summer. So they actually like it hot and they'll be more active when it's warm. Um, if it's windy out, that, that they will usually not fly as much. So on, I guess if it was a, cold windy day makes sense right or a cooler windy day you're not going to see as many um today we had kind of overcast conditions but it was 87 degrees and i saw quite a few butterflies flying around between about 11 like well 10 30 to like 12 o'clock so that's a nice that's a nice time for us to go out and see them because it's not as hot um, if, as long as it's warm above 80, you're, you're going to see butterflies then. And if it gets above like 100, they're not going to fly around as much either because they're cold blooded. So that affects, they can over, get overheated too. Let's see. So these are tiger swallowtails and they're puddling on some mud there. I think they're all tigers. Yeah. Uh, this is an example of what you, if you plant, um, we've got some prairie drop seed kind of in the background, and this is glade coneflower, yellow coneflowers in their peak nectar time. There's a great spangled fritillary, a little skipper of some kind, and some painted ladies on there. Just a random shot, one, uh, one probably June of our, one of our beds. And that's, that's that one. So let's see, do we have any more questions over here right now? I don't see any more questions right now in the chat. Um, I did post the link to the survey again for folks to fill out and uh, I've emailed it out. Um, and then I'll, at least I'll have you send me the handouts and the PDF of the slides and I will email those to everybody. Uh, once I get those. Yeah, so um, that's, that's all I was planning on sharing, at least with the PowerPoints. Um, but I'd love to take any more questions that people have. And um, kind of my final thoughts are, hope that I have come, that, that my theme of like, if you plant the plants, then that's how you're going to attract these birds and butterflies. That's the biggest factor. And then also they will need some shelter and of different kinds too. Um, there's so much in our neighborhoods in suburbia that we have planted that is not native plants and is not food for wildlife. Our oak trees, maples, um, cherries, things like that, those are really saving us right now. There's a lot of moth caterpillars that lay their eggs on oaks and cherries and some maple. And the birds 
depend on those little caterpillars. There's what is the, the statistic? Um, chickadees. It takes six thousand to eight thousand caterpillars, little green caterpillars, to raise one nest of chickadees. So when the parents are collecting all those caterpillars all day for like two weeks, somebody counted those, and that's a lot of little caterpillars. And they're getting out those off of mostly like oak oak trees if they're in your neighborhood. Looks like we've got one last question here. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. How long does it take a butterfly to migrate to Texas? Um, I think I'm not I'm not exactly sure. I would have to get the the better answer. I'd have to probably look at Monarch Watch. Um, and depending on are you saying from Missouri to Texas or from when? A lot of them, what happens is they come up to Texas and some of the southern states, lay those, those monarchs that overwintered lay eggs and they die. <laughs> so the eggs are then the next generation. And then those butterflies, once they grow, they go to Canada. So there are some that they lay eggs on the way to Canada, and then we get random monarch butterflies, all, you know different parts of the summer here in Missouri, but most of the population goes all the way north. That's that's their what they do. And then they also will breed, make another generation, and that generation comes south again. And they'll lay eggs on their way through. Um, there's a lot of different misinformation out there that some of the older information was like, five broods a season and that that's not correct um if you look at monarch watch i think it says two broods i'd have i'd have to look at it again so when they're migrating south again from missouri once they get to us they're they're coming through in september or most of the population is like late august and early september and into late september and they're wanting to be down in uh, texas to mexico by the time it gets cold. So I, I'm thinking like a month from us, but I could be wrong. All right, well, thank you, Lisa, for a very interesting program. And thank you everybody for coming this evening. Uh, we hope you'll join us in the future. Um, keep an eye out. Um, next week, we'll be publishing our fall schedule um, for September through November and uh, Lisa and the Baroque Woods folks will be back to do a program specifically about monarchs and the migration and tagging at a couple of our locations. Yeah, before uh, before you go, Beth, I have a question for just you about that. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, well, have a great evening, everybody, and we'll see you later. All right, bye. Bye, Terry. <laughs>